Welcome to the Monday, July the 18th meeting of the Montpelier Design Review Committee. We'll let committee members and staff introduce themselves. Eric, don't forget to pull your microphone closer to you for introductions. Eric Gilbertson, member. Martha Smirsky, member. Meredith Crandall, staff. Steve Everett, member. And at this point, we'll let Meredith review the remote meeting procedures. Okay, so I am going to be sharing my screen here. Um, a lot of the share screen is more for somebody who might be watching um, over Orca and want to log in. There's some tidbits for other people as well. Um, so for those viewing this meeting via Orca Media, you can participate in tonight's design review committee meeting using the Zoom link shown here on your screen, um, or you can dial in on your phone uh, landline or cell and put in this meeting ID number. Um, if you go in via phone, you'll be able to hear everything that's said and you'll be able to participate verbally. You just won't be able to um, see the share screens. But if you're still watching on uh, via Orca Media, that'll pop up on that screen as well. There might be a little delay, but it'll still work. Um, if you have problems accessing the meeting, please email me at mcrandall at Montpelier hyphen vt.org. I will be monitoring my email throughout the meeting. Um, for those attending via Zoom, turning your video on is optional. And sometimes if you're having issues with your sound, turning video off will help improve that. Um, for everyone attending, please keep your microphone on mute when you're not speaking. This will reduce background noise. Um, and please reserve the Zoom chat function for troubleshooting or logistics questions. If you have a question or comment about an actual item on the agenda, please raise your hand, either physically or using the raise hand button on your Zoom toolbar. Um, and then um, when the chair has recognized you, please make sure to state your name for the record. Um, I think most everybody here is involved and, and sort of an applicant in one way or another. Um, but if you know for people for applications that have multiple people representing them, please do make sure to state your name um, when you're speaking. Um, we don't have any just general members of the public on tonight. Um, in the event, I do get notice that there are members of the public who are trying to access the meeting and can't get in. We will have to continue the meeting to a time and place certain. I'm going to now hand the meeting back over to the chair. Thank you. And if committee members have had a chance to look at the agenda, do I hear a motion to approve the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. Second. All in favor of the agenda, Aye. speak your names. Aye. Martha. Steve. So the agenda is approved. And unless anybody has anything to add, we can go to the first application for 8 Summit Street. Owner applicant Timo Bradley. He's on remotely. Okay. Did to go ahead and describe your application for us and clarify where Eight Summit Street is. Uh, Summit Street. If you're heading on College Street um, south uh, towards Berry Street, um, just as you're cresting over the hill, it's a right-hand uh, turn. It's just a very quiet little street. On the south side of the college, um, we're backed up against the the college parking lot. Um, I think it's. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the hall. Uh, there, um, I own uh, with my wife um, a duplex, and my parents actually um, are our tenants. And it's the um, garage in question is the one that they use. Which we actually happen to have two garages. Um, theirs is the one that's closest to the college. And um, the problem um, currently is that um, there's there are two doors, both of which are fairly narrow. 
Uh, and my mother, um, you know, who's honestly getting a little bit older, um, is, old, is can't, um, she doesn't dare to drive into it in the winter. And um, likewise, uh, they had my, I honestly, I, I was hoping my dad would take care of this. He wasn't available tonight. <laughs> and I'm having to be, thank you very much for allowing me to be virtual. I'm, I'm uh, uh, here in Quebec City, actually. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, they had a contractor out to look at the garage door specifically. And uh, the rails that are there are, are too, too old, too rickety. Uh, to outfit with an automatic door. So uh, what they want to do, and, and of course, um, via them, I'd um, like to see this happen, is to exchange the two doors that are, you know, about eight feet wide with one door. Um, and uh, hopefully, I, I gave basically all the information I had to Audra, and hopefully you you have it there. Um, and so the idea would be to to remove the the central post between uh, between the doors. Currently, um, it is a, a sort of a basic structure, staple plate truss garage. We're really pretty certain uh, that there's really no no weight bearing issues uh, there with the front. We should should be able to do it. Um, the contractor who's going to do the work is Bob Clark. Um, and uh, he certainly um, is an experienced guy, and uh, we'll know after when he when he gets into that process. Um, you know, is there a structural issue or not? Um, the inside of the building is actually sheathed with plywood, uh, so I think there's uh, this certain amount of, sort of ruggedness um, uh, related to that. Um, and this is just something that my parents really want to have done, and um, so I'm hoping. hoping And looking at the pictures, it looks like it's a raised panel. There looks like four sections tall, but it says no windows. So I'm assuming the top panel is solid as well. They are hoping, uh, and I'm sorry that we didn't actually get a printout uh, from the garage door company. They're hoping to have, uh, to actually have, not to have raised panels. They like this, they prefer the smooth and they're actually, I think, hoping to not even have uh, windows in it, which is a change from what is there currently. Uh, my father, to be totally clear, they're paying for this. Um, uh, father was very clear that you know if the if the desire was that they put on raised panels that they would be willing to do so, um, and so there's there's certain definitely flexibility um, on our end. Um, so it's just how wide are the existing doors? Say again. How wide are the existing doors? The existing doors are uh, I think both in the eight foot range. I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. Eight foot. Eight, Eight feet. feet. Eight feet. And they end up with the same thing with the post in the middle. No, um, no. He said he's going to take. He's going to take the post. They're going to take the post the out. Post is going to come out. He said it. It. Uh, it's not needed structurally. I, so what they what they could do if they need it, if they need the structural strength, they could add a header above it. Yes. Yep, and in fact, I think. But if there's uh, if there's trusses up there, you may not need the structural strength. But anyway, for framing, you could always put a header, a sixteen foot header across that space for the sixteen foot door. Yeah, that's that's correct. I I spoke at length with Bob about this, and uh, you know, I we I think we just sort of agreed that we might as well put a glue lamb header in there. Um, just, uh, I, you know, I also know Chris Lumbra, uh, you know, pretty well. And I think I, I know that he would hope to see that. And so I, you know, if that's, a, if that's the desire, um, you know, I just, it just doesn't, it makes sense to me uh, to, to go that route. I don't, I really don't think there's any structural issue. Like I said, that the, the garage, that garage happens to be, um, uh, has a, a staple plate truss system. Uh, at least I, I think it is. The one that's below uh, is not, it, it's not a sheath and it's open. It's definitely a, a staple plate truss. So I assume that it's the same. It may not be. And we'll find out when we get the work on it. 
Okay. Oh, did you say that you're going to have windows or no windows? The my parents' desire is for no windows. Uh, there is a, a passage door that has a window uh, in it. Likewise, there's um, a, you know there's of course lights inside. So no windows and four panels high, and again there would be a a flush panel, not a raised or panel, but a flush panel. That is the desire. Uh, that's what my parents are hoping for. The color would remain white? I believe so. OK. It's obviously not an historic garage. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> not with T111, although it has its own special place in history. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Anybody have any questions, comments? No, okay. No. I can go through the criteria. I will read down through for all projects, exterior design and materials of new construction or alterations of existing buildings shall be consistent and compatible with the characteristics of the existing building or other properties in the district. Additions and alterations to non-historic and non-contributing structures shall respect and be compatible with existing patterns and setbacks found in adjacent buildings. And the remainder of that is acceptable. Existing buildings shall be recognized as a physical record of their time, place, and use. Acceptable. Proportion, compatibility of relationship between width and height of facades as well as relationship of width to height of windows and doors, acceptable. Rhythm, visual patterns established by the alterations of solid walls and openings in the facade of a building shall create a rhythm, acceptable. Architectural features, including but not limited to cornices, windows, shutters, fan lights, entablature, trim, and other forms of molding or character defining detailing prevailing on the existing building shall be considered in the alteration of a building acceptable. All in favor of the application, speak your names. Eric. Martha, I'm a yes. And Steve says yes, so the application is approved. Um, so Timo, because the committee didn't make any specific recommendations or tweaks to the application, um, we will try and get the permit issued as soon as possible because we don't need your signature on the form. Um, and can we just mail it to yep. you? Yep. Okay. Eight, eight Summit Street. That's that's perfect. Uh, okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to log out now. Um, I've got a Quebec City to go look at. So <laughs> enjoy. Okay. Good luck with your project. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye bye. Bye, Timo. Next application is for 46 Berry Street, TW Wood Gallery in Monteverde Music School. Placement of new signage and a mural. Yes. Yeah, so you've actually got two forms here because I had to. The mural doesn't qualify as a sign, so that's got an all project with just some limited items to review and then the sign form. Okay. Um, someone here. Well, we've got three someone. So whoever wants I'm gonna, to I'm gonna Meredith, I'm gonna speak first and then I'm gonna let my colleagues in the room answer questions. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Therese. Sure. Okay. So thank you everyone for hearing us this evening. Uh, my name is Therese Mejo, and I am the vice president of the board of trustees for the TW Wood Gallery. In council chambers, we have Susie Swanson, who is sitting right there raising her hand. And we also have John Landy, who is our treasurer and trustee. John also is um, a treasurer and a board member for the Center for Arts and Learning, which is the, where the gallery is located at 46 Berry Street. And I will be referring to Center for Arts and Learning as Cal, just in case you get confused. The Wood Gallery, as you may know, is home to 19th century, the 19th century collection of Montpelier native and American master painter Thomas Waterman Wood, 
a contemporary exhibition art space for Vermont artists and the holder of a historic collection of artwork from the Works Progress Administration era or WPA. And in fact, the council chambers that you are sitting in are graced with WPA era watercolors, which the gallery has on loan to City Hall. We are here to seek approval for wayfinding signage to the gallery. Currently, there is only one sign for the entire building, a Cal lawn sign on Berry Street that was installed some years ago. There's a small shingle hanging off that sign with the gallery's name on it. Other than that shingle, there is no indication that TW Wood occupies half the building, nor is there any way for visitors to know that the entrance to access the gallery is located down Monsignor Crosby Avenue. We cannot tell you how many phone calls we get from people standing on the corner of Berry Street and Monsignor Crosby Avenue, GPS is in hand, who cannot figure out, quite understandably, how to get to the gallery. This sign permit application is our attempt to rectify that problem with four discrete new signs. An address marker, as there is currently no street number on the building, two signs above the entrance on Monsignor Crosby that announced the gallery's presence and our logo, and our name in raised letters on the facade over the portico entrance. In our application, you will see renderings of each of these proposed signs. In addition, we are proposing a mural depicting one of Thomas Waterman Wood's most iconic paintings of Montpelier, the quack doctor, to hang in the portico on the wall to the left of the gallery entrance doors. Again, you'll see details of that in our application. We believe these new signs and the mural are a critical improvement to the building and they will help promote the gallery as a vital Montpelier cultural center, both to our residents and to visitors to Vermont. Thank you for your consideration. We will do our best to answer any questions you may have. Very nice. Uh, make sure you're up near the microphone so that everybody can hear you, Susie. I was just saying that's, that was very, very well done. Very well said. <laughs> Do I have to turn it on? Is it on? Uh, you shouldn't. No, no, no. Don't, don't, don't touch. <laughs> <laughs> Just scoot your body close. Scoot the chair closer. Um, so don't, don't like touch anything on there other than maybe to bend the microphone closer to you. <laughs> Sorry, I could see Orca in the background shaking his head rapidly. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't help I use my mom voice, so. You did it very good. Right. At least you didn't get a ruler across the knuckles. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sticking here. <laughs> on the mural, um, is that removable? Is is it on the building or is it on some sort of a, a other kind of a? The intention for, I mean, there is no mural there right now. Mm -hmm. um, the intention is to, you know, the building is brick yes. and mortar. And the intention would be to attach it via little screw placeholders, okay. so, not in the brick, but in the mortar. Right. Okay. Good. So it is done on either a piece of board or some sort right. of canvas. It's a composite material that uh, the person, the company that's doing all the other signs is doing this one as well. Doing the mural. Okay. Uh, Teresa, I'm just going to ask, could you hear Susie? I do. Okay, perfect. I'm just making sure that that's all working. Thank you. Some people's voices don't carry very well. And so some people have to be really close to the microphone, but you've got the right, right voice. Can you just <laughs> tell me exactly what to do? <laughs> I'm not sure if the, the color of the lettering is, is an accurate blue, but I have a suggestion only because the readability of signs has so much to do with contrast. If you look at the picture of the ground sign, a little small picture of the ground sign there, look mm -hmm. at the difference between the Monteverdi sign and the gallery sign. Uh, um, may I ask a question? Which are you talking about? The shingle that's hanging beneath the Center for Arts and Learning. This is the yes, ground the sign. Ground street. sign in front. That sign is already there. That's not a proposed I, sign. I, I know that one's already there. Yeah. But I'm just suggesting, if you want the signs to be readable, look at the difference in the contrast between the Monteverdi sign 
and the gallery sign. Um, okay, so the both signs are already there, but you're just making yes, a suggestion. Yes, you don't have to change that, that one, right? If, but you're making unless a suggestion you dress, to dress be, it up. But I'm just darker. I'm just showing the readability is in the contrast right. of the colors. Now I'm not saying I'm not saying don't use blue, but use the darkest blue you feel you can, because the darker you go, the more readable it is. Okay. And I'm, I'm specifically referring to the new signs you're installing, the TW Wood. There are blue doors underneath, but if you were to make that as dark a blue as you can get, it certainly will match the doors down below. It doesn't have to be the exact same color, even if you go darker. And then in particular, that vertical sign, the proposed facade sign, the vertical sign, Again, if you've got a white background, make that blue as dark as you can, and it will be more readable from the street. So I just have one comment about that, and I totally understand what you're saying, and I've, I'm not disagreeing, uh, I, but I just did more of an explanation as to why we did it that way, and that is it, we were matching the colors in the logo. Right. So, I mean, that's- If you were willing to stretch that a little bit, I mean, again, it's only, a suggestion for you you don't have to but you want if you want to make the sign as readable as possible go with the darkest versus the lightest background gives you the, the most readability now do we know i'll pass that on and again if you may it. be able to tweak the color a little bit and still have it within the acceptable you know acceptably close to your logo yeah, I mean, we can right. We can actually make the logo color slightly darker and not make it look different from the normal. And know, again, I'm just looking so at your, away. looking at the ground sign and looking at the difference. Right. I mean, and again, the sun's going to fade it out over time anyway, a little bit. But again, I'm just trying to make it. <laughs> no, I mean. No, I understand, and you're also trying to make it so we don't have to redo the sign anytime in the near future. <laughs> Although we have, um, we're, we're working with um, some folks that have said that basically the way they make this composite sign, they are very durable, mm -hmm. and actually the lettering itself is metal, you know, okay. and uh, so it should last quite a long time. Okay. And the lettering stands out from the building or stands right, out from the, the facade. lettering is raised. Okay. I don't know if it gives you the dimension of the lettering. Yeah. I think it did somewhere. Yeah. And again, I mean, the font, the size, everything is fine. Mm -hmm. Just tweak, tweaking it to your benefit as much as you could within your, you know, color scheme or your logo. And then in terms of the amount yeah, it's of six, signage, a six yeah. inch metal lettering. Yeah. Six inches. They, uh, so Martha was just asking about the amount of signage and they're well within the allowable signage given the amount of frontage that the building has right. um, of street facing facade. So yeah, they're, they're just fine. I did quite a bit of research on that, like <laughs> we, almost ad nauseum. <laughs> we, we had several <laughs> conversations. <laughs> I thought Meredith is like, I hope she doesn't come up. <laughs> no, so, yeah. Great. No, that looks very nice. I have, I think having the street number there is really going to be helpful. Uh, Therese wasn't joking when, you know, I mean, we have been thinking about this for a while. I'm the newest board member, so I can't say we have been thinking about it as my understanding is, um, you know, a number of years ago, we kind of started down this path. But, you know, in today's terms, people put in, you know, things in GPS and you go down Barry Street and I think people probably know they're on Barry Street, but there's nothing that indicates that it says no. it's 46. Mm -hmm. And um, because there's streets and it's a little busy because of MSAC next to us, um, it's just we want that ease of clarification. And um, yeah, so I think that'll be incredibly helpful. And plus, you know, we've done, we, we have um, a sign design assisting us and and placements and how it looks. And, and uh, we were very careful to make sure that when people drive up, they clearly see, you know, this is the gallery, this is the entrance, not the front door. The front door isn't really a front door. <laughs> uh, Therese has 
her hand raised. Oh, I just wanted to add to what Susie was saying that um, we um, opted to put the number sign on the existing lawn sign and not the building because as Susie just said, that front door is actually an emergency exit. It is not an entrance to either the gallery or to the Monteverde Music School or to the offices for the Center for Arts and Learning. It is simply, so we didn't want to confuse anybody by putting it, in, putting it on the building. So that's why we opted to put it where we did. Good choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just have one easy question. I'm assuming that the mural is going in the same kind of an alcove where your entrance is. Yes, the main it, entrance. It, it doesn't show up on the drawing of the alcove. Uh, I think it it's does, right but it doesn't mind. I don't know what. Maybe you get an older person. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm not. It's not clear that that's the same alcove. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That is the main alcove. entrance as you go down Monsignor Crosby Avenue or whatever it's called. It makes a lot of sense to put it there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right over where it used to right over where it said St. Michael's School. I actually don't know. Yeah. It used yeah. to say St. Michael's School. It doesn't it anymore. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'm a newbie to town. I wouldn't know. But, uh, but we I'm have a, I'm an old beat of town. Okay. So I know. <laughs> and I have to say we have some people on the board who have been on the board for many, many years and are very protective of the the historic value of the building and so we have been very cognizant about trying to make sure that you know we are keeping i mean we're not making it look like a school but you know we realize it was a school and all the rest any other comments questions anybody have then i'll go down through the criteria and i'll do first for the mural Exterior design and materials of new construction or alterations of existing buildings should be consistent and compatible with the characteristics of the existing building or the properties in the district. Uh, removal of historic materials, and that doesn't apply here. Character defining features, finishes, and construction techniques or examples of craftsmanship that characterize an historic building shall be preserved. Uh, there are no deteriorated character defining features. And any treatments that cause damage to historic materials, including but not limited chemical or physical treatments, such as sandblasting, or should not be approved. And again, your placement of the attachments for the mural and the mortar joints is right on. Thank you. It's acceptable. Existing buildings shall be recognized as a physical record of their time, place, and use. Any new development shall be differentiated from the old, but shall respect and be compatible with the massing size, scale, architectural features, detailing an overall character of the primary historic building and nearby historic properties. Acceptable. And that's about all that apply. Yeah. So this is for the mural. All in favor of the mural, speak your names. Martha, I say yes. Eric says yes. And Steve says yes. So the mural is approved three to zero. And then the next criteria list is for the signs. Size, location, design, color, texture, lighting, and material of all exterior of all exterior signs within the design review overlay district shall be compatible with the building and structures of the site and surrounding properties. Acceptable. Where appropriate, signing shall respect the original sign placement and sign bands on historic structures. Acceptable. If a building has multiple tenants, there shall be consistency in placement and size among all signs, acceptable. Recommended that sign placement be centered over building entries, acceptable. Sign installation shall minimize damage to character defining materials on the building, acceptable. In masonry buildings, fasteners shall be in the mortar joints, acceptable. Sign design, color, and typography shall respect historic precedents where appropriate and shall be the appropriate scale for existing and new buildings acceptable. Sign support structure shall be compatible with the building architecture and must not be overly complex or dominant in and of themselves acceptable. 
All in favor of these signs, speak your name. Eric is there. Martha, I'm a yes. And Steve says yes as well. And just administrative. Yep. Oh, did I not do the and mark out on that one? You can get them to so sign. I've got pen here you can use. If I could get one of your signatures. Oh, uh, actually, you didn't put any recommendations on here, but you're here. So it's yeah. good to have signatures consistently. Yeah. So you'll just want to sign here and then here. Same spot on both. Yep, same spot on both. Lovely. It's long over if you want to. It'll be nice. So are we good? Hopefully it'll cut down on your phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> so Audra is probably going to be happy asking too. For, <laughs> asking for directions anyway. Uh, <laughs> Susie's, Susie's developed a terrible crush on Meredith. She's going to keep that. <laughs> <Thanks for bugs. laughs> so, so Thank you. you. <laughs> unless you want requests otherwise, um, once these are issued, the permits issued, we'll mail it. Okay. Okay. But we can tell our um, contractor to go ahead. All right. Yeah. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you for making this a simple process. Thank you. Good You're luck. welcome. Good luck with your project. Thank you. Hope you don't have to spend hours here. <laughs> oh, I've got a meeting after this one. I'll be here for a long time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay. And is someone here from Kellogg Hubbard or should we move? Nope, Jesse's here. Oh, you good. Remotely. Uh, there you go. Yep, sorry, my um, computer kept muting me. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jesse Lynn. I'm one of the co directors of the Kellogg Hubbard Library. Um, I feel like I should start off with a, a, an apology because we didn't, uh, it didn't occur to us that we might need to go through design review for some of the benches and tables. So uh, the benches are in place. You might have noticed them at the library um, and the tables are on order. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit of the backstory and then we can talk a little bit more about it. But um, there were two funding initiatives that helped to support this happening. So one was a capital campaign that the library did called Give the Library a Lift that we um, completed. And then we had a lot of funding to support different initiatives. And one of them was uh, to create a new outside space for patrons to enjoy. And that's part of the backstory of the benches. Um, the other part was um, one of the COVID related grants that the Vermont Department of Libraries sponsored was uh, grant money for um, all libraries to be able to create outdoor spaces because that was such an, a need during the pandemic and has been a continued need for people who are seeking safe spaces to be able to use library Wi-Fi and just to be able to enjoy books and enjoy being in each other's company outside. So we secured this grant from uh, the Vermont Department of Libraries and went ahead and started purchasing things. Um, and then truly um, apologies only realized after that we needed to um, there was a process we needed to go through outside of the grant that took a lot of time to figure out how to get. So um, in essence, what that does for us, so you'll see in the pictures in the packet for the library. So the three benches, we, we're, we think about the property or we've been thinking about the property in two different ways. Um, we've worked really hard. I've worked really hard over the years to have the main street entrance of the library be um, sort of more of the traditional kind of historic um, to kind of keep in line with that. So the three benches that we purchased match the two benches that have been outside of the front of the library for years now. Um, it's kind of that more traditional when you're looking at the, the main street side of the library, the three bench, the new seating area sits to the left of that. It's tucked back where there used to be a Peace Park monument uh, that unfortunately fell apart over the years and we had to remove, but there was formerly a different sculpture in that area. So we had had this thought for a long time of making that into a space that would be a good space, say for book groups and small groups to be able to use on the side of the building. But we wanted to have the benches 
kind of stay in line with the other benches that you can see as you're facing the main street side of the library. And we have sort of a particular aesthetic that we're aiming for on that side. On the school street side, we're going for a sort of a more of a kid friendly. The school street side is kind of is our primary children's entrance. It always, with the addition being kind of front facing, it's always had a kind of a different feel. Um, you'll notice this year we added Adirondack chairs that are very colorful. And man, we hear about that all day long. People are so excited for that color, that sense of the space that that's opened up there in use constantly. Um, so in keeping with the kind of that colorful look, we the tables that we were um, have ordered to add are co also colorful, primarily for use by families and for use for our children's librarians to be able to do programs. So one of the tables um, is an ADA accessible table that would be used right off the walkway um, for larger groups. And the other one is a smaller kind of four bench for like games, card games to be a kind of game, like board games to be able to be played or families to have picnics. So we were looking for things that are very washable, kind of colorful again, to keep in, in line with this idea of kid friendly, um, but that would stand up over time to the elements and also the high traffic that we get at the library. Um, and then um, the chairs, the Adirondack chairs will come inside in the winter and the picnic tables most likely we're going to shift to the back of the property and lean them up so they wouldn't even stay outside all year. We're going to have to sort of see when we get them. Um, but they're also, I mean, they're 300 pounds, so, but our idea is that with staff, we can move them at once we kind of get a sense of where they're going to work best and then we could adjust them for programs. So that's kind of where we're at. That's That was the, our idea and intention and kind of how it came into being. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. The picnic tables, are they full-sized or are they child-sized? They're full-sized, so they will fit adults. Mm -hmm. um, and one, if you see in the picture, one has like the four benches around. Um, yes. So it's it's set for a kind of like more picnic style. And the other one is, uh, I think it's eight feet, um, but it's uh, their ADA table. So it actually extends out so that a, a wheelchair can come up on the ends. Okay. And you said that the benches that you've already placed, they match the ones that are out in the front on the main street side? Yep. Correct, okay. Yeah, this year we, we haven't done any kind of a more permanent securing of them. They're just in place with wood. Um, and the idea was to kind of see how they how they work, feel, see if the placement feels quite right. Because sometimes you put things out and then you realize if you shift it a little bit, you'll get a little more shade or if you adjust it just so, you know, um, so we wanted to kind of give it a year to sort of get a feel for if they were placed exactly correctly before we think about whether we have to add anything to, to secure them more properly, but we haven't gotten there yet. Does anyone have any comments, questions about these uh, movable objects? Yeah, it's it falls into one of the specific one things the... we look at for historic buildings. So I was I the Adirondack chairs. I could say, ah, you can bring those inside it during the day, you know, at different times. I'm not going to put those in, but these, especially the anchored benches, I couldn't yeah. find a way to approve it myself. Well, actually, they're just sitting on skids, right? Well, now. right now, but the plan yeah. is to anchor them. An anchor them. If if you do anchor them, a good way to do that would be to put some kind of a permanent. If you want them in a, so that they're not movable, at least if you put them on some kind of uh, e either a slab or stone, at least mm -hmm. that makes mowing <laughs> a little more yeah. a little We've easier done... to deal with. Yeah, totally. We did that with the front ones. We actually had a donor who was so um, got so disgusted with the dirt pads that inevitably get created around them that we put them put granite under them. But yes. now there's dirt pads around the granite, so it was it was fully, <laughs> didn't fully didn't fully meet the donor's wishes. But um, but yeah, it was it's the, our our lawnmower appreciates that. <laughs> okay. So anyway, there's only one of the criteria of the sixteen. <laughs> that applies, and this one is for landscaping, screening, and site furnishings. Projects within the Design Review Overlake District and subject to the landscaping requirements in Section 3203 shall consider the following. 
Site furnishings, including fencing, seating, and other types of site furniture visible from the street or side yards. Existing historic and contributing resources such as street trees, fences, gates, walls, steps, gazebos, walkways, front and side yard patterns shall be retained or restored when impacted by the alteration of a building and walls and fences shall be compatible with the site and building and scale traditional materials designed that reflects the period of the building or compatible with the surrounding context. Acceptable. <laughs> All in favor of the application, speak your names. Eric says yes. Martha, I'm a yes. And Steve says yes. So the application is approved. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Thanks You're for all your welcome. help, Meredith. <laughs> You're welcome, Jesse. I, I tried. I just I couldn't find a way out of it. Um, no, no, you are good. I, I should have I should have thought to ask in the first place. So, <laughs> uh, so we'll, uh, Audra's already drafted the sort of site plan report that we have to do that goes along with it. I've got to review that, and then we'll get this out the door to you as soon as we can. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Thank Jesse. you. Thank you. And our last application is for 138 Main Street. Owner Vince Luzzi and applicant Sandy Vinston come up to the table. Welcome. Hello, Hello how are Sandy. you? You're welcome. Uh, so yeah, just make sure you speak into the microphone as best you can so that Orca streaming and our recording gets it. That's an okay angle. That way I can see yep. everybody. I've got a nod. From I mean, idea. is it okay if I take my mask off so I can speak? more clearly okay um so i suggest focus on the door first since that's this application um and then if may i you know, give Jan a brief super brief introduction to explain the context yeah okay yeah. and then just and then i would say focus on the door so we can get that decided because that needs yeah. to vote and then the other things that you wanted to talk about, we can talk about after this time. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Um, you're probably all aware and familiar with 138 Main Street, which is a definitely a landmark building and it's on the historic register. I know it was my father's favorite building when I was growing up. And um, I just found out that it has had a ballroom on the top floor wow. in that the tower that goes up. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> We um, did an energy audit for Vince Luzzi and um, Chuck Reese, who specializes in energy retrofits for historic buildings, um, said that in the 20 years that he's been doing audits, this building was the by far the worst of all the worst. He said it wasn't even comparable to the worst that he had done before. Um, he, in fact, had to turn off the blower. He couldn't even get it to 50 pascals, and he couldn't get it to stay at a, an even vacuum. So uh, it's a seriously bad building, which goes along with the incredibly high amount of, of fossil fuel that it uses every year. So they um, both is an effort that they had been planning to do for a while before oil prices went up, but now it's made much more urgent due to the oil prices. Um, they're trying as quickly as they can to get as many renovations as they can do this year. Um, so the airlock had been an obvious thing to do first. That was the furthest along. That's what we're gonna focus on tonight. Um, I just wanna be completely transparent and let you know that there's four other things that are moving along. Um, I didn't want to bother uh, Audra today with an application. So hopefully- She wasn't here anyway, so. Okay. <laughs> well, hopefully they will make it to you folks on August 1st, these other four. But I just want to be completely transparent that this isn't okay. the Did only thing we're asking for. Are? Yes, be happy to. Yeah. So that is- um, and I'm happy to share pictures of you if if there's time and you want to look at them, we're happy to. Because I we would honestly like your feedback on things like, so the first is that they're switching to wood pellets and there has to be a silo for that. Um, and uh, it also needs to be, uh, the legs can be in the floodplain, but the the 
the pellet part can't be obviously. So, um, so that, um, then there, uh, wait a minute, let me just look at the cover sheet to make sure I get everything. Um, they're also switching to ductless mini splits for the seasonal heating and air conditioning and the, in, not the entire building, but basically the top level and then um, some of the second floor buildings that have a lot of heat gain. So um, there are two condensers that they, they've been able to get down to. One will be on the roof in the back and the other one will probably need to be on the wall, the east wall that faces the um, uh, let's call it east, uh, faces the roundabout. And um, I'm happy to show you pictures of that tonight. I have I had everything ready to to submit the application. I was trying to get it in so you could at least be aware of these things. But I have that picture. The third thing is um, to the, the um, front porch that we're talking about tonight. The ceiling is, as far as we can tell, completely uninsulated, and there's a heated space above it. So those floors are very, very cold. And so we're asking to remove those boards from the ceiling. In the process, they probably will not be reusable, but to, to replace them with beadboard of the same size. And right now they're, it's painted black. So replace, replace it and, and replace, replace the color. Um, and the fourth thing is um, in the process of the analysis, we had the engineer there and we realized that the um, windows aren't really in keeping with being in the floodplain. The floodplain's actually right, just right about the first floor of finish floor level. Um, I'm sorry, the design elevation is right around the first floor that the actual floodplain is a little lower. So I think we've got that right. Um, so, so the, the windows, the engineer has proposed that um, 11 of them, maybe 14, we're just, that part we're working on as fast as we can, will have to be replaced with uh, vents. And then we would either brick up or use wood infill in the windows, um, painting it black. Again, we would like, these are the things we really would like some input on soon so that we can try to get them priced out and, and get a design we would like to be fully um you know cooperative um with design review but if, for instance we need to figure out with that pellet silo um if you would like it screened um would you prefer it to be black or green I, we, we don't the, vince Luzzi doesn't care he would like to do it's three meters tall ten feet, ten feet tall but it has to, because of the floodplain, be on a a um, concrate base, so it would be about right two feet. It's so like twelve feet. But it's actually because the whole first floor is so high, the top of that I calculate will be less than the roof that's adjacent to it of the porch. So I think we can screen it. Um, but to to Meredith's point, what what we're here for tonight. And the reason why I'm here and hoping it can be decided tonight is because they won't put it through into the production line and we're not sure we can get the airlock in this fall. Um, but if you don't have enough time to finish this tonight, then it would go to August 1st. But we can't pay the deposit and, and get in the production line until we have an indication that it will be approved. I have done specifically. We're, we're just we're that's tonight's is the airlock. Yeah, tonight okay. is just the airlock. Yes. But so any any input you have on the other aspects will help them put together the next where, application. Yes. Is there a I, wood? I is there a, the airlock is part of the relative position of other things? Well, it's just that I started on that first. Like okay. we haven't got the design for the pellet boiler yet. So we don't know the size of the silo. Yeah. So I am putting in the largest silo because yeah. we have we there's not a lot of time this is already the end of july why don't since um, the application tonight is for the airlock why don't we address that first 
Okay. And then we can, at that point, we can ask some questions about the other part without sort of. I would be thrilled. I would be thrilled that. if we could do that. So the, actually the, uh, the location of the airlock is perfect. In, if it's facing the uh, Southeast direction, it will become a solarium for the <laughs> front entry. Well, back when Margo George was on, um, she on the planning commissioner design review. Anyways, back then, Vince tried to get almost exactly the same design through. Mm -hmm. And Margo wanted it to be removable seasonally. And um, now that it's really necessary, we cannot modify the front door. We know that. We can, yeah. for instance, take out the front door. And actually, we can put some weather stripping in it. But it's a double door and it's just inherently got some problems. For instance, it can't be locked. Oops, I probably shouldn't have said that. On the... <laughs> well, anyways. anyways, so um, the airlock uh, at the time there there wasn't a way to make it seasonal, but now Portland Glass can make it seasonal. So they've come up with some technique that the, the only thing that would be permanent would be a channel up in the ceiling, which is so high. Like I really, I can barely focus my eyes up there. It's painted black. These channels would be black. Um, they're so high that anyway. So, um, uh, and then uh, I forgot to say this in the application, but there would also need to be some channel on the brick. And I'm trying to get that is close to the, edges and is unnoticeable as possible. Um, the, the rest of it can be removed, including the pin that would hold it on the, on the corner into the floor. We have to drill a small hole into the floor I to say that too. I can't believe I, there wasn't any narrative in this and I just forgot mm -hmm. to do that. Um, so, um, and then we can replace it with a plug in the other in the you know whatever seven months that it's not being used uh, plug on the floor so um we think that it will have a pretty minimal impact off season um there are some mailboxes on that sidewall already and we're going to put them all inside the airlock so there's kind of a line already that would be there um uh Vince would like to put a keypad on that door, um, which would then require some kind of panic bar on the inside. Um, the, also, the other issue is that the um, porch landing uh, doesn't meet full ADA regulations for the door. I mean, the door is going to swing out in the direction of egress, and. Um, it should theoretically have three feet beyond it, but obviously we can't, um, <laughs> there's no room for that. So I've pushed it over to the side so that people can go out kind of at an angle and then come down the stairs. Uh, Chris Lumbra has approved that. I, I've already shown it to okay. him. Um, so I think that is, that's it for what I can think of to describe. Um, if you have any questions, I have some really basic questions. Yes. Sandy. Is the building being used residentially now or is it businesses? There are three residential units in the building. One in the far back has its own door off mm -hmm. the side porch and then two up at the top on, on the third floor. And what do these double doors open into? The grand vestibule. Okay. And, and all of the offices or spaces go from that grand vestibule so it's basically an open space there mm -hmm. and then the stairway going up is also inside that vestibule as well yes yeah and it's a kind of a grand staircase it's mm -hmm. goes up three three stories okay, okay. it's been is, wavered is, so it's not closed off is the material in the airlock entry, are they framed? Is that framed around glass either? Yes. Well, we're going to have to use plexiglass because it's removable. So okay. otherwise it would be super heavy. Yes. Um, they have a really um, hard one that isn't scratchy. 
Yes. And I submitted a sample. I hope you still have made it to you, Meredith, of the um, black metal. Okay, I think Audra put that in the original file downstairs. Okay. I can run downstairs if anybody needs to see it. No, that's okay. It's okay. And then the door itself is metal as well, or is that a... So it's just metal and then this um, polycarbonate material. Everything's okay. black yeah. metal or polycarbonate. So the actual airlock itself is is see through, but only completely. The, only the structure is. I, I, yep. I, I noticed that the frame is heavier on the door with the lock. Because of the lock. If I have been trying to get a, a code for this the the entrance door is uh, you know push button access code if that could be then maybe there doesn't have to be a lock on the outside um but right now um it's proving very difficult because it's a two door unit and you have to be able to egress with only one action and um so you have to have a push bar it's complicated but right now I, I just no, the narrower, the smaller we can make. I wish it. Effect. Well, that's why I I have actually been advocating for no touchpad on. The, um, yeah, I, I could see. I think it'd be a good idea to lock that. I mean, otherwise, you're going to have people living in. They would be very visible, however, because the light stays on all night. But um, like you know, still. Yeah. The uh, and Vince is willing to. Take it off for mm -hmm. yes. I think we got a part of the permit set to date that can be installed. And I, I don't know what. Yep. Yeah. What he said, whatever, whatever pleases you. I, they kind of <laughs> is desperate to try to get the building more efficient. That would be a real um, game changer for me, Sandy. I I don't like the looks of it. I I understand the reason why. And I understand that we all need to be a little bit more energy efficient, but it kind of breaks my heart to see this big thing in the front of this gorgeous building. Well, the precedent would be Vermont Mutual. Yeah. yeah. What, what, uh, just to give you an idea of what percentage of savings, heat savings comes from going to the door? That door, that door is a major contributor to the problems. Because it goes on just as a big vestibule stairway and stuff, right? It goes straight up. Yeah, and the doors opened all the time. So, you know, in and out, it's a major, major entrance and exit. So I, 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 I don't, I can't say that I like the idea of putting something there at all because I voted against it when we tried before. But um, I think that now that it's removable on a seasonal basis, and it is reversible. If somebody decides they want to take that out, uh, it's not going to be much damage to the building and putting it up. Yep. Or and even if if you just leave it, you know, the seasonal and it's gone, it's not going to be much visible. In that, I should also say that I've specified that the screws can only go into the mortar, and yeah. Um, also, I think you'll see that there's pendants on the arch around the door. I've specified that it, it passed by it. And it says on the roof, right? No, it's going up to the ceilings because it's going to be supported by the ceiling. It, it looks from the pictures that the entryway actually is arched, correct? It's, it's onto the porch? Yes. So like the, the entrances, but the ceiling inside is it's much is, higher. It's much higher. The ceiling's like almost straight. eleven feet high. Oh really? Okay, and that's yeah. where the this is going to be flat ceiling. Yeah, oh, with, okay. that we would put the ch black channels against the black wood, and the the other panel one is hidden behind the plaster part of the porch. Yep, framing decorative. Yeah, it'll be between the door and that pilaster. Yeah, it's well inside. Yeah, yeah, if you look at the floor plan, 
you can see that it's well behind. Yes. The, yeah. yeah. Yep. And and it has to be this wide so that you can get in the door. And I didn't want to get into the actual door trim. Yep. What would your thought there are going to be? I'll be squashed into the airlock Stacked. area. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you can just make a double row right. and bring the outside ones inside. That's, yep. Yeah. That's pretty simple and straightforward. Yeah. The, I mean, the other thing as far as you know, attaching it to the mortar, they make they make a, a molly that and, and that accepts some machine screw, mm -hmm. so that if you've got three points of attachment, you could run three mollies in and they just leave them in the brick, and they're gray, so they disappear. Yep. yep. The color disappears anyway, and yep. then every time you take it off and put it back on, the machine screws go back into the same mollies. Yep. And yeah, and well, and those we're thinking would be permanent, so yep. that it's not coming in and out, in and out, and having to eventually. Be switched the other, up. the other thing is the when you drill into the floor to attach that corner, mm -hmm. you can use the same thing. You take the screw out remove the frame and then put the screw back in, which is going to be a little, you know, three eighths, a quarter inch. Uh, <laughs> it'll disappear and just put it in there, which maintains your, he the threads. actually had a sleeve that would stay there. And then there was a plug that would go oh, over okay. it in the summer. Now that works fine too. What would your, if you were proposing a season, what would you do a May through October? Or uh, for for it to for be the summer, off. For it to be off. Well, we had snow this year at the very end of April, so yeah. um, it seems to me um, the goal would be off first of May and five five, five fifteen to ten fifteen. That, or eleven fifteen. That I mean, it, it's hard. Two falls. I just know because I have a garden. Two falls ago, we had our first snow, and we had heating season by December. Or sorry, September fifteenth. Mm -hmm. And last year, we didn't have first heavy frost until I think it was the second week of October. I don't think we. The problem with global warming is not that it's just easily just like shifting up. It's that it's more dramatic storms and more erratic storms yeah we just so, for for enforcement purposes and and yep. we have to just pick some yep. days i know that for the like the outdoor seasonal seating arrangements things like that um around downtown a lot of times um october 1st is the the end date in part for ability for city plows things like that mm -hmm. um and this is a different situation but October 1st is a time when we're often looking. For Could we do May already. 15th to October 1st? I'd rather I, see it I, May 1st. 15th better be to take the year leave season. Yes. So in other words, okay. your yeah. winter season when the airlock would be there would be 1015 to 515 to That's, May. Let's say oh. that would be good. Okay. Awesome. Can, okay. Uh, I, I get why we're doing it that way. I would rather see it come off the 1st of May, but um that's my feeling well you still have co cool evenings and well, yeah but we're that, not that, that building to... sucks how many gallons yeah, of fuel will that, that building use in a season true right I if it's getting warm they can take it off soon I can, I it was like that. a crazy yeah, amount what um, like four or five thousand gallons uh, i think so i hear you Marcia. oh i don't know i i trying to find where i put so the five thousand gallons at five dollars a gallon is twenty five thousand dollars that's a nice Easy computation. So until up until 2021, they were spending at least eleven thousand dollars on oil a year. I don't know how many gallons. And that's that at about two fifty a gallon. So double that. Yeah, they were using two fifty a gallon. You can double that to makes a nice round twenty two thousand dollars. Hard hard to have affordable housing in town when you're paying. <laughs> yeah those kind of numbers. So the, the recommendation would be that the, the airlock would be up from 1015 through the following May, May 15th. 
Okay. And of course, if we have a warmer season, they want to take it down, you know, take it down earlier, earlier, or put it up later, or put it up later. That's certainly fine. And again, that gives you gets you through leaf season, which is usually the last week in September, first couple of weeks in October. Yeah, Columbus Day. Just make sure you get the mic, Eric. Columbus Day is the oops, I broke it. <laughs> Columbus Day is the uh uh Lisa you gone by Columbus Day. <laughs> I have uh I don't recall seeing leaves of any sort of color after Columbus Day. Right. Yeah. If you know what, it still works without that, right? So don't worry about it, Eric. I'll fix it before DRB. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it still works. Yeah, you said it does. It just doesn't have the like buffer. A strong wind. <laughs> but in the meantime, we're not allowing you to touch anything. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Sandy, are you going to be able to sign for Vince that yes. you agree with the time period? Yes. Okay. Great. Any other questions regarding the airlock entry? Okay. I'll go through the criteria applicable to the application. Exterior design and materials of new construction or alterations of existing buildings shall be consistent and compatible with the characteristics of the existing building or other properties in the district. The removal of historic materials is not applicable here. Character defining features, finishes, and construction techniques or examples of craftsmanship that characterize an historic building shall be preserved. Deteriorated, no deteriorated defining features here. Uh, any treatments that cause damage to historic materials, including but not limited to chemical or physical treatments, uh, shall not be approved. And again, uh, the attachments in the mortar joints is acceptable for this installation. Existing buildings should be recognized as a physical record of their time, place, and use. Any new development shall be differentiated from the old, but shall respect and be compatible with the massing, size, scale, architectural features, detailing and overall character of the primary historic building and nearby historic properties, acceptable. Proportion, compatibility of relationship between width and height of facades, as well as relationship of width to height of windows and doors, acceptable. Rhythm. Visual patterns established by the alterations of solid walls and openings, windows and doors, and the facade of a building shall create a rhythm. Patterns of solids and openings shall be preserved to the extent feasible, acceptable. And lastly, windows and doors on historic structures. Character defining windows and window and door patterns, placement, sizes, proportions, and original features such as trim, sash, and moldings shall be preserved to the extent possible. When preservation is not possible, such character defining windows and doors must be re rehabilitated or replaced in kind. Windows and doors that are not character defining may be replaced, but such replacements must be compatible with the building historic building style materials and architectural features acceptable all in favor of the application for the airlock entry and again the recommendation is recommended season for airlock entry is october 15th through the following may the 15th can we make that a requirement rather than a recommendation well it's you're recommending it be a requirement so i'll put it as a requirement on the permit Given that, all in favor, speak your names. Eric says yes. I'll say yes, just with the requirement. Yep. Okay, and Steve says yes. So it's approved, three to zero. Thank you. And you have and a pen up there, Sandy. So if you can sign under Steve's name on this, um, and that way we'll be able to move forward on issuing that permit. Um, can give you about five minutes for questions on the rest, but we're yep. gonna have to all switch over all our technology for the yep. next meeting. Yep, so yep. what I wanna just do, I'm gonna skip through the forms. 
and I'll actually skip through my account to cover letter. This one is, um, you can, as long as I get them all, they can go ahead and order. But that's what we're submitting for images. So the, the, the right after you see the top sheet of the silo, there is um, a couple on job sites, not my job sites, other people's job sites. One is black and one is green. And then I did a sequential view walking down Main Street. Mm -hmm. You cannot see it at all from school. Okay. You can't really see it from over by the library and the Methodist church. Um, and you don't really notice it walking towards town. It's really towards the roundabout. Mm -hmm. And um, interestingly, there's only about 20 feet along the sidewalk where you can see it. Um, it's behind, there's a tree right there you'll see in the foreground. And then there's the the side porch. And I thought Vince had a good idea that very commonly on side porches, you see trellis going all the way up. Yep that it, this would be a good place for something like a black trellis or there's a lot of black and then there's a dark green on the, on the a lot of dark green and gold. Yep. So I was thinking black trellis pot perhaps. And then the, whatever color you think the silo should be, it would be beat behind that, a, you know, would, a few feet. I would paint the silo black. Okay. Only because if you look at, I mean, uh, a lot of outside recreational areas. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of ski areas. Yep. All the towers are painted black because it blends in with the landscape. Okay. Uh, the tree bark, primarily black. Yep. Or gray, dark gray, black, dark brown. I mean, the dark the colors will disappear. And if there's any landscaping around it, the black will disappear with any landscape. How about the, well, so when this comes forward, I'll be asking, would you like to see a lattice and maybe would you like the lattice to be green so that there's a contrast to it or maybe the black, lattice should I be black. I would paint the lattice black and I'd put a climbing. Any climbing kind of viney. Ivy or vine or something that can climb up the, and again, just depends. Okay, you know, although black, those black, tend black to keep lattice. hold moisture on the wood. So I would hate to do some a vine that ends up making the rest of the building. Well, a square lattice in pressure treated. Yeah. Or they now make a square lattice in a, uh, a clear or a Zach. Well, I'm not, that's white, but I'm not worried about the trellis. I'm worried about if the vine goes up onto the roof, yeah. then, then, cause that's an historic roof. Okay. And then, so item number two is the, um, uh, the two condensers. So the one on the roof will not be visible to anyone from anywhere except for the apartments that are across the river. And I, I guess I don't know what to do about that. Um, you can also screen the condensers with a lattice as well. Okay. Yeah, we saw that with um, the the memory care unit further down when their application yep. they had to put Gary the home. roof and they just did it wasn't even it was just a the kind of same kind of fencing they used for around their their yep. um um garbage area so if you have okay. we're already using that kind of trellis somewhere else doing that or some kind of fencing like I actually tried to see if we could find a black condenser because or dark brown because I thought that would go better against the the brick as well and we can still keep looking for that but um at this point it's like off white yeah sometimes it's yeah sometimes it's the camouflage versus the actual physical screening exactly so the the front condenser um i don't know if you saw the where i drew it on the photograph it has to be two feet above the highest flood level so um my thought was to put it right next to the two meter or six meters that are already there and um put it where it has to go. And Vince would be very happy to add a lilac bush or something in front of it. Um, the if, build, and I, actually the, uh, they make a stand that you can put the condenser on, but we've used the building mounted bracket. That's what we're planning very, to do as a bracket. Very inconspicuous. Yeah. 
and they work they work great it gets it gives you the perfect spacing yeah and actually we've enclosed one with lattice it was mounted to the building and then we basically put a, a post in the ground and then attached the lattice uh, in an angle around it well that just, lattice would be in the floodplain so we'd have to ask you if that's okay in audra <laughs> if that's okay but I think they'd be interested in that or something again, like, oh, I can pick that up, like a lilac, okay. like a lilac. Um, one thing I noticed when I was walking towards city <laughs> is that that um, lawn between Cameron, you know, the build, the red brick building with the big columns yes. and this building is that lawn in between is really kind of nice as a break between large buildings. Mm -hmm. And it's a very deep lawn um that it kind of looks nice having it be the bare wall there so maybe a lattice would be good in that that would just you know not be as bulky as a lilac um it, the fact that it's going to be something like eight feet off the ground when it's done um maybe seven feet um it means that that would have to be a good size shrub um the number the Am I done with the five minutes? Um, you you can get like a couple more, but okay. I've already got people trying to sign on to my next meeting okay. <laughs> because I tell them to try and log in yeah. 10 minutes so early. The, the, um, the last thing was uh, the floodgates. So the choice on the floodgates, um, oh, well, then the ceiling. Do, does any, do you think that anyone's going to have problems with taking down that ceiling for insulation and then putting the ceiling back up? I, it's going to be the same. It's going to look the same, same. If, right? If we can reuse the boards, we will. Same materials. But my experience is usually the boards are just self-destruct with the, because it's tongue and groove. Now, as far as insulating above, would it be foam or would it be dense pack? I, I usually use, for cold floors, use rigid um, po extruded polystyrene um, because it's the highest R value and it does it, it doesn't have to be netted it, it can go in if they use spray foam there um then it, it they can't go the full height thick depth and i try not to have a gap between the ceiling material and the insulation because then that's it could condense on top of the ceiling material condensation and then ultimately rot it out because there's not a lot of ventilation in there. So my they, thought was fill the use, whole void. And the use, like all seasons, has a minimally expandable foam that fills the space but doesn't pressure the building materials around it. Um, it would have to be done in lifts because it's, you know, I don't know, we don't know the thickness of the oh, joist, okay. but if it's 10 yeah. inches, I, my thought is just take it down and do it, yeah. is fill the void and get it back up. Um, and once then it, once it's the same material, okay. you know, same st style, dimension material, and painted in the same way. And then the the thing on these flood vents. So the the building got a grant after the ninety two flood and moved up almost all the mechanicals and wiring out of the basement. Yeah. Um. So. Uh, the problem now is that they didn't address the windows. And I, what I'm learning is that they don't have to address the issue of those being basically portals for water to come into the basement. Um, they are allowed to leave the voids there, the, the openings in the, because water would br break the glass and go in. Yeah. So they're allowed to leave that there. The engineer said it would be much better for the wall and the whole structure if it ever did go to the 100 level or higher to have the flood vents in there. Um, then the, the other really serious issue is heat loss through that glass because the, the glass, it's hard to keep it from out from not cracking because it's so close to the ground. So the thought is to fill, and he doesn't care whether it's with two by fours or with brick, but we thought that you might like brick better because some of the windows are filled with brick already. And then whether they stayed brick color to match the upper brick, because the, the base is granite, or if it was painted black uh, to look more like the windows, 
and then if the if it's two by fours, they would also suggest painting it black to look like the windows. There is already one window that was removed for the oil. So I would just leave it, leave the windows, frames, fill it in with whatever you want. Don't try to match the brick. You're not going to do that. So don't don't you would rather have it filled with two by fours insulated? Still read. Yep. So they will read and then we can put trim around it. That's fine too, to you know, yeah. try to replicate the look, but the problem is the glass. Now, if you're filling it in, what how it is how does the vent work? What are they suggesting for vents? It's an insulated byway vent, bilateral bi-directional vent. So our thought is to put them in the upper corner so that the water can rise. It's really a last ditch effort because you know, if the water only rises a couple inches, it's used to that much pressure. But yeah. as it goes up, it's really dangerous. Now, how big is how big is the vent? Not very big. Sixteen inches wide and eight inches high. Um, yeah, I've got nine We're minutes done. before okay. my next meeting. We're going to have to wait and approve the meeting minutes. The okay. next meeting. <laughs> Sorry, thank guys, you. I've got people trying to yeah. come in. No, thank you very much for this time. Really, very much appreciated. Okay. okay. Thank you. It looks okay. like you're doing it. Well, we can start getting pricing on the woods. So I appreciate it. Thank oh, you. So we still need a motion to adjourn officially. I, I move adjournment. Did you want to approve the minutes or would skip we, we got to skip it. Okay. I just don't have time. So all in favor of adjournment, speak your names. Eric. Martha. Steve. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs>